This is Git Minutes episode 43, with another interview from the Git Merge conference this year. Next up is Git contributor and maintainer of Git for Windows, Johannes Schindlin. He has a lot of thoughts and ideas on development, community, and code reviews, especially in open source, and especially so in the development of Git. We talked to Johannes about the difficulties of contributing to Git and uh, tools that could make the experience more user-friendly, like, for example, Public Inbox, which is both a mailing, mailing list archive and a Git repository. Gitminus is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. You can get $10 of credit by entering the promo code gitminus 10 after you register your account. Now, on with the show. Okay, now, welcoming back to the show, uh, you, Johannes Schindlin. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, so, uh, you're at uh, Git Merge 2017, yesterday at the Contributor Summit. That's uh, correct. Yeah, we had lots of fun there. Yeah. So, uh, let's just start with that and uh, tell me what you thought was the most interesting discussion yesterday. <laughs> That's very easy because I proposed a subject and uh, I got to lead the discussion about it because I care a lot about user contributions to, to Git, not only Git for Windows, which I maintain, but also to Git. And a complaint that I hear frequently and that makes me very sad is that it's not easy to get to the ma Git mailing list. So most people uh, say it's easy because you have email, right? That's, that's correct. But you have to exclude HTML from your email. And some people don't even know how to do that with their mail program. Mm. And so they send a mail and it just gets silently dropped and, and that's frustrating. That's not a great user experience, and we lose those contributors. They they are smart people. Uh, they don't want to battle contribution processes. They they want to battle real technical challenges and provide their expertise to help us make the project better, make everybody's life better, because Git will be better and helping us better. So I I tried to dis to get the discussion going about whether we have a chance to actually provide tools. Because we're good at providing tools that make life easier, right? Yeah. Git is such a tool. <laughs> and now we could make, we could design tooling around this process that maybe is able to shift it toward a more user-friendly uh, way so that we can accept changes by people who did not struggle for half a week just to get the initial contribution going. Yeah. So... Just to kind of, uh, for people who aren't familiar with the with the contribution process, uh, Git is not developed on GitHub or anything like that. It is a purely uh, mailing list driven uh, project, much like the Linux kernel, kernel right. does. Yes. And it's even hosted on the same uh, mailing list server. Yes. Uh, so that's kind of where you go to find the archives. Uh, no, there are no archives uh, on there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of archives, but um, yeah, these they're elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so th this is actually where we had a bit of drama. Uh, was it last year where Mark, was it Mark Mail? Or one of these big... Uh, uh, Gmain. Gmain, yeah. Gmain went down. Exactly. And everybody oh, could not up. find their old discussions anymore right. because we used to mostly make Gmain links. Yes. And, now, and now there's something else called uh, this this uh, public inbox. It's called public inbox. It's, yeah. um, it was started by a Git con contributor, mm -hmm. by Eric Wang, who is most mostly famous for Git SVN, Yeah, even if he does plenty of other things too. But yeah. that's, that's his thing. And uh, he... He just said, how about making an archive ourselves and, and just maintaining that so that we can rely on it mm -hmm. and we can have links that will work even in 10 years. Yeah. And he even made it possible that you can uh, paste the latter part of the Gmain link yeah. and still find those discussions. It's, it's a little bit manually involved. I would have wished that he had an input box yeah. uh, somewhere on the, on the website where you could paste your Gmain yeah, uh, URL, and then just go to the right mail. But that would require JavaScript, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he does not like JavaScript. Um, he also apparently does not particularly care for CSS or for predefining things a little bit. I guess there's lots of room for a contribution on that end, too. But yeah, a large part of the tools that we discuss, the possible tools uh, that we'll hopefully play with and, and develop uh, is to use this archive, which is not only a web server, uh, uh, it's not only on the web, but it's also a Git repository, mm -hmm. having every single mail that was sent to the 
to the Git mailing list. And he actually was very good to collect the old stuff. So in total, it's 788 megabyte, heavily packed. And we can use that to identify where were patches and then using the author information, which is the sender of the email, together with the date, which is codified in the commit that where the patch was applied. So we, we can cross-reference mm -hmm. and we can put back some some of the metadata, some of the links that were lost just by going from Git to a mailing list yeah. back to Git. So when I'm looking at a um uh, when I'm looking at the Git source code and I'm blame, blaming or, or annotating the code to find like who made this line and why was it made, I still have a long way to go before I can actually find the main discussion uh, yes. that is behind this change in the code. Correct. I mean, uh, I, I can look at the commit message and start searching yes. uh, through the mail archives based on that, but it's, I'm probably going to get like a lot of false positives. <laughs> that and you might not actually find the the message because it is actually quite common that some rewording is done in the process. Sure, because after, so, after I get a patch accepted yeah. in Git, it, it's up to uh, the, the core or the, the, the maintainer, maintainer yeah. uh, to sort of commit it, actually commit it. Exactly. And if there's a typo, obviously he will fix it. Yeah. And if there's something that's slightly unclear, sometimes he decides that it's just better to, to uh, touch it up. Sure. And so that's good, but then you can't find the mail anymore because the mail had a different subject. Mm. But the thing that I hope will help is that we should be able to identify the patch still by looking for the author, so the name and the email address, plus the date. Yeah. Because if, if, that, if we have that link, then we can actually generate from this public inbox archive from that Git repository. We can generate all the information that we need with one tool that is then used by another tool where you blame and then you jump exactly precisely to the thread. You get the URL on public inbox, which is a permalink, so it's stable. And then you can see what was going on there. Okay. I mean and this will be taking away such a lot of tedious especially for contributors themselves. I mean, I contribute, so I have something like 10 branches that are in flux right now. Okay. And if there's any comment on any of those mails, I need to go to the right commit as fast as possible so that I can actually put in the right fix. Yeah. And just having to dig out so many things. And I'm an old timer. I'm, I'm with a Git project for almost its entire lifetime. And if it's hard for me, I cannot fathom how hard it will be <laughs> for really smart people who then feel utterly dumb and nobody likes to feel dumb and so they go away and we lose their contributions. And that's so, that. Uh, the thing I wanted to understand first about the, this, uh, the, the public inbox archive is if you have the author and the date, is that enough to find uh, the link to the commit? I mean, are, isn't there like a lot of space between there time-wise? I mean, maybe a little. It's kind of up to the maintainer how fast he is from... Mm -hmm. Uh, getting the mail into committing it and, and also uh, if you're doing lots of things at the same time uh, yeah. or, or sending lots of patches in different subjects, you're going to get a lot of bad links, I guess. Right. The, the thing is, um, a little background here. So the way the maintainer handles patches from the mailing list is not by tediously copying the patch <laughs> and trying not to white space corrupt it and, and then carefully putting it into the work tree and then... There's tooling. There's tooling in Git itself. Yeah. It's called Git AM, which is uh, short for Apply Mbox. And so this takes an Mbox, w which is a kind of a single file that has a number of, of emails mm. in its raw format. Yeah. So it needs to be in the raw, raw format, otherwise it won't work. But yeah, so it's basically, if you're in your mail and you, you copy some of those mails into a new folder, if you imagine that folder is now a file in a very specific format, that's an inbox. Mm -hmm. And then this tool just takes all those patches and applies them with the correct uh, commit message, with the correct line. It strips the patch prefix of the subject line. It takes the author information from that email. Okay. And it also, and this is crucial, takes the date from that email. Really? So the author date that you see in, those, in the Git log 
That is actually the date when it was sent. Ah, not when it was authored and not when it was committed. If you want to see the information of when it was committed and by who, in this case, Junior Amano, the Git maintainer, then you have to pass a, a little option to Git log that's dash dash pretty equals fuller. Okay. It's a little obscure, I, I agree, but if you really need to dig that far, then you need to read a little bit of documentation. But the thing is, th th this date now does not depend on how long, t uh, how much time passes between the maintainer reading that mail and applying the patch. Sure. But it really depends on the metadata that is in that, uh, in that mail, in the raw format, and crucially, this is exactly the date that we also have in this Git repository that has the mail archive. That sounds like a really sweet solution for like solving a lot of this trouble. I mean, it won't solve I everything. Hope. I hope. Um, yeah. what well, about we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I'll try to find some time to give it a, uh, a go. And we'll see. For um, sometimes, so th there's one, compli one complication that I need to mention here. The date is, is stable, OK? But the author is actually not stable. The problem there is the first line of the male body can specify a different author than the one who sent it. Okay. It's sometimes uh, used to fix up an email, an email address. So for example, if I, as an employee of Microsoft, want to uh, contribute a patch as Microsofty, then I have to send it as a, in a different way from a different email address because I can't use Outlook. Outlook is a very prevalent mail client and you cannot send emails to the mailing list that have patches and that are not white, pa white space corrupted. Mm -hmm. The thing is Outlook really thinks that mails are human readable, yeah, not machine yeah. readable. And so it reformats them, sure. it rewraps them. And it makes sense if you want to read the mail on a small screen, not to have these really long lines as if you read them on a desktop. So you send this mail from a different account, probably your Gmail account, where you set up some SMTP so yeah. that you can send it via the command line. And then in the first line of the mail body, you actually specify, look, this is from me with that email address, with, with at Microsoft.com, right? Yeah. So we even have tools that make that. So if you have a git commit mm -hmm. and you use the, uh, the git format patch, it automatically realizes, hey, this is not your regular uh, email address, so I will put it in there. I, as a ma maintainer of Git for Windows, often use the same feature to actually contribute other people's patches. Yeah. Because they prefer the simplicity of GitHub pull requests, which I accept as Git for Windows maintainer. Okay. And I then take these patches, put them on top of the master branch of Git, mm -hmm. uh, fix bugs if needed, fix merge conflicts if needed, and then the authorship is still the original one. So I send this patch by a contributor XYZ in their name with their email address. And this is all very transparent because it's written in the first line of the mail body. So yeah. this is something that the tool needs to take into account because the git am command that the git maintainer uses to apply those patches yeah. changes the authorship accordingly. Okay. So in that case, the tool that tries to cross-reference patch mails with the corresponding commits in the Git history, yeah, th they need to look for the right author. But that could be solved as well in uh, in this tool, I guess. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, I mean, the majority will probably work. If there are a dozen cases where I need to do manual work, then I'll just do that. Sure. And hopefully in the future, I won't need to do that all that much. And maybe I'm not the only one who will work on this because I really hope that this tool will eventually lead to a process where it is much, 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 much easier to contribute patches for somebody who does not want to struggle with contribution processes but solve real technical issues in Git. Mm. So I'm sorry, I just made you lose the <laughs> talk. Should we no, no, it's a, we, we shall continue. Okay. Uh, another thing we talked about was uh, the what's cooking email. Right. Can you uh, <laughs> talk about yes. how that relates to this and, yes. and where the problem is with that? So twice a week, sometimes more often, sometimes less often, but as a rule, twice per week, the Git maintainer sends out mails whose subject line is what's cooking in Git. And there, 
uh, the state is presented of the patch series that are in flux. So in flux means they are either being integrated into the maintenance branch, so the next patch release where the minor, uh, not the minor, the micro version is increased. So for example, after 2.11.1, which came out yesterday, the next one would be 2.11.2 yeah. to fix any bugs in that release track without introducing any new features that could break another thing. Mm. So the main branch is that integration branch. And there's master branch, which leads up to the next minor increase. Okay. So that would be 2.12. And then we have two more integration branches in Git, that's next, mm -hmm. which is kind of trying to give patch series a larger user usage, larger testing before it enters master, okay. or not, if it's deemed to really be too bad. But usually next is the thing where well, you still have a chance to fix something, but it will show in the history. Okay. It will be an extra commit. Okay. Uh, and then we have the fourth integration branch, which is PU, like proposed updates. Uh, and that is free game. That is rewritten every night, sometimes multiple times, uh, to have the newest versions of the patch series that are still really discussed and really hotly ah. developed. So this is kind of where the, the, the uh, inboxes come first. Yes. Or land first. Yes, exactly. And then when, when you uh, when you decide, hey, this needs to be changed. Uh, this is my contribution, my patch. Then you change it in your local uh, Git checkout, and then you generate a new iteration of that patch series, and that is sent. And then uh, when it's picked up, it enters PU and replaces the old version. Mm. So this is another contention that we discussed yesterday, where it is really hard or not hard, it's tedious, it's tedious, time consuming and tedious to just figure out whether you're still at the same iteration, or whether your new iteration has entered PU, um, what things are still, what still need to be done, and also sometimes whether the touch-ups by the Git maintainer actually find your favor, because sometimes it's not a typo, sometimes it's exactly what you meant. Yeah. And it was just misunderstood, and that's all. Mm. And may maybe the resolution of that was not quite how you want it. So you need to compare the version that's in PU with the version that you have in your local repository. And those commits, the, the SHA ones, the, the, those long hex strings that I actually identify each commit, they are different. Sure, sure. They're the different. They must be different because the maintainer adds his sign off. Yeah, so yeah. they are actually different. But it would be really nice if we had tooling to find out what has changed that is not the sign-off and that is not the committer and the committer date. W what other things have changed? Is this what I want? Or should I actually clarify? Right? And in order to keep track of all these influx patch series and iterations, the maintainer sends out these what's cooking mails that have th the information about PU, about what branches were merged there, about next, what branches were merged there, and master and main. And when things graduated, that's usually the most interesting thing f for any contributor because you want your stuff to get integrated, sure, right? Absolutely. You want it to go live. And then uh, this What's Cooking mail, that details all this, but it has no reference whatsoever to the original discussion. So you can't even, and sometimes a message ID is listed, mm -hmm. which you can use if you know how to, uh, to find the mail in the archive on public inbox. Or if you have one of those really technical mail clients, you can search for the message ID. But if you have a regular mail client, you can't. So, right? so there, there's no cross-referencing. So that's something that I hope that this tooling could also provide so that you not only have an easier time to uh, associate the discussion on the mailing list with the appropriate the corresponding commits in your own work tree or th the commits in the integration branches but also I would hope that we could automatically touch up those what's cooking mails to include all this really valuable information uh, maybe even in HTML an auto generated whip it up uh, put it on GitHub pages or something, so that you can see this what's cooking mail, and you have links to exactly the points where you need to go. Mm. So 
so uh, the what's cooking uh, email is is sort of half generated a bit of manual work uh, goes into creating that but it, it is it could be automated to create this email right it is actually completely automated uh-huh. um, the main git maintainer uses tooling to do that yeah. but some of the information that i want to have in there yeah it's just is not there. simply not there and i hope to be able to generate that from uh, the mailing list archive in mm-hmm. that Git repository by cross-referencing. And, and if uh, a patch series overgoes or goes through many revisions and that uh, gets changed or, or the maintainer changes that in, the, uh, in its repository, then you can, you can recognize that because every time you rewrite a series, they get new uh, dates, right? Right. Well, they get new dates. You have to... T- you really have to pay attention then because the past iterations are no longer visible. Yeah. That's also something that I would like to change. Maybe this tooling could actually generate tags where the tag has the name of the, and the iteration number because usually you have patch V1 mm. or patch without any V1 is impl- implicitly V1, uh, then patch V2, V3. Sometimes, it, so I think my highest was... Uh, nine or ten uh, that was really tedious but uh, in the end i hope we got something better than we yeah. would have otherwise had and if we can then have uh, automatically tagged the comments in pu with the appropriate uh, ver- iteration number and those tags never go away then mm. we have a perfect record and this is actually also where i would like to store the metadata that is then generated by the tool so do you mean tags as in, as in using Git tags for that or a part yeah, of the commit? Git tags. Yeah? Okay. Git tags, real tag objects that are then pushed to some Git repository where you can see it, where you can inspect it. You can uh, click on the link inside there uh, and then you, you are exactly where you want to be without having to do all that manual labor. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, other tools uh, or other similar use cases, I guess this is solved by having some sort of re- centralized review system yes. that yes. keeps things, uh, you know, Garrett is the big elephant yeah. in the room uh, that is like a very uh, strict uh, review system, I guess, yeah. that, and that tracks this information very, uh, very strictly, yeah. uh, where you can... And, and they do so uh, by generating this change ID, which becomes a part of the commit message yes. uh, in these patches. But that has a big impact on everybody who is contributing in patches as well, because then yeah. they have to generate a change ID, and it also clutters. I, I sort of it adds overhead to the commit messages right. and, and the history as well. Yeah. So that's maybe not such an elegant solution as the tag-based one. Yeah. I think. I think we simply wouldn't be able to push anything through on the Git mailing list. Yeah. There would be too much um, resistance to that approach. Yeah. So what, what we try to do is provide tools or, or create tools and develop them that make first our life as, um, as contributors easier and then maybe even convince the maintainer to actually change a couple of things in, in his workflow, which is always... It, it takes a lot of time and you want these things to be robust so mm. there is there's a lot of hesitance and I, I as a Git for Windows maintainer completely understand when you don't want to change your workflow because you know that it works and you know if you change something there's a good chance that it breaks mm. so if we go back to the uh, uh, the mailing list that no outsiders can really send emails there because they're probably using Gmail or Outlook and, right. the, and, and they make HTML emails by default. Um, let's just uh, th- think through what would happen if we uh, turned off that uh, limitation on the, on the mailing list. Uh, and everybody could send in HTML mails, um, <laughs> yeah. which I'm sure a lot of mailing list subscribers would not like just because they don't like uh, HTML emails. Um, right. But uh, there's but also this yeah. uh, threat of spam, I guess. That that is a lot, a lot more. Yes. It, it happens to be <laughs> a, a restriction that also fixes a, some of yeah. another problem. We still get a lot of spam on the list, but right. uh, not as much as we would have if HTML emails were yes. allowed. So, well, it, it's a convenient way for for the mailing list maintainer mm. who <laughs> really does an incredible amount of work. Given the Linux, the really high volume Linux mailing list oh, yeah. and the high volume Git mailing list, I understand that you have to strike a balance between how much work is it and how excluding are you are. 
Mm -hmm. And um, to exclude HTML mails really excludes such a lot of spam. I understand. I get that. On the other hand, it really makes things hard. So maybe at some stage we have enough tooling in place that we can actually generate not only patch patch mails with format patch, but we could maybe even have an integrated tool that sends automatically email in the correct format with your reviews, with your feedback, with the new iterations as a Git command. So you never even have to leave your uh, your Git checkout. Oh. So that's that's the that would be the ideal situation, right? When you work on code, you want to be with the code. <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, and it would also open the doors if if we do that, where you would just uh, look at the uh, the Git mailing list archive Git repository. Uh, if that tool would look at that and realize, hey, there's new discussions about your patch that is in this branch here, in this repository, in this work tree. Uh, and you could then automatically jump to the right place in the code. Then reviewers ca could also use that to actually step away from this patch review that we do these days to a code review mm -hmm. where they have the full code available to really look, okay, did the contributor really pay attention to the entire file or not? Or in one case, uh, the wording in the patch, in the diff, looked a little funny. And if you looked at the context, the entire file was written that way. Yeah. So th the contributor did the right thing, yet still was slammed for, why did you use that Yeah, word? yeah, yeah. I understand. Right? So, and so code review should be easier. It should, it should be with the code. So do you imagine uh, this happening uh, like on the client side, so to say, uh, on, on your uh, machine in the Git tooling or uh, in a more like a review centralized system? What well, ideally what we will have is tooling that allows me to do this from the command line yeah. in, my, uh, in my working directory. But a good point was raised by Josh Triplett, who works on, on these things really for a long time, much longer than I even thought about this. And he had a good point saying, if we now put this into a data format, into data structure that is standardized, then we could integrate that, or w other people could integrate that with their review systems. And all of a sudden, we really have this beautiful thing where everybody puts their expertise in. The review system people, have their uh, graphical user interface that really makes review easy. The people who want to use mails for review, they are still on the mailing list. Uh, the code is available. We could integrate this into uh, integrated development environments like Visual Studio, and everybody wins, mm. right? In the long run, this, this is not only for the Git project. Yeah, so if, if this was like a, a, a standardized format for for doing reviews, basically, right. uh, in, in the, that sort of embeds uh, the, uh, the patches and the, the comments on the patches in between. Yeah. And this would also be something that you could mirror between systems so that yes. people can use either the Git tooling locally that they like or or, or mirror it into uh, some GitHub or Garrett or, yes. or, or whatever web uh, yes, service you have for that. Yeah, or, yeah. or Bitbucket or GitLab. You can name them all. It, it, it would be so beautiful there if there was a standard that we developed together, mm. so that, together so that all our needs are addressed, and then yeah, people choose the tool, the graphical user tool or the porcelain, the front end, if you will, mm. uh, to do things in their preferred way, but we still interact via the standardized data format. And it wouldn't even have to be Git specific, dare I say. I mean, this lots true. of review systems uh, that work like with patches, or they're just based on patches, and they yes. they can come from any version control system, really. That's correct. Oh, that is something. <laughs> so, how how do we go go about uh, doing this? <laughs> slowly, <laughs> slowly, <laughs> because it will need a lot of time. Yeah, it will need a ton more discussions. But at least yesterday, I had this feeling that we were getting somewhere. Yeah. We, we were productive. We we brainstormed. We 
rejected a couple of things, but more than that, we came up with some proper ideas, some really good ideas, some promising ideas, mm. how this can happen. So I personally want to play it with some simple tool that just cross-references the mailing list archive with the available data in the PU branch. Yeah. Uh, hopefully something will come out of it. As soon as I have something to show, I will send it to the mailing list, of course. I will show what I have. I will push the things, the tags, if I have some, uh, to my repository so that people can look at that and give their feedback and maybe even contribute themselves to this project so that eventually we are at a point where we have tools that really make our life easier. And once we have that, we can convince other people that this is a good idea. Mm. Great. Is there anything else uh, you want to share from the conference or uh, <laughs> that you want to announce or anything like that? Oh, it's a lot of fun. It's, yeah. it's all. I, I hope that many, many people uh, tune in via the live stream because, yeah, it was sold out for a long time already, yeah, right? Sure. And it's, it's just very interesting. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. The diversity here is amazing. It's, uh, unfortunately, we do not have much diversity in the Git developer core developer group. That's, that's something I don't like at all. That's and true. I will be happy when we finally change that or n when we are more inviting some something. But this conference here indeed is already very diverse. You see people of all ages, all genders, <laughs> uh, of all colors. And it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's heartwarming and gratifying to see that so many people benefit from what you deeply care about and work yeah. every day. I mean, I remember at the first uh, Git merge in, in Berlin, and it actually occurred to me that, like, okay, I'm used to technology conferences being, you know, uh, something like 10% uh, women, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe more, sometimes less. But at at Git merge in Berlin, there was not a, a single woman, I, yeah. I, I think, as far as I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, we definitely have. You can see that re very obviously that there's the gender balance is not equal by far, but uh, by any stretch of um, imagination, but it's it's definitely more than just 10%. Mm. Yeah, we've come so, a long way, but yeah, we also need to get them into yeah, the, uh, the, the con contributors. Well, we need to make things easier, yeah. <laughs> right? We need to uh, make things just more convenient and mm. more inviting, more open. Yeah. And then hopefully we'll get the benefit of the diversity because there is no question about that that the more diverse your teams are, the better is the quality, not only of the work that you output, but also of the culture that you develop. It's much more fun to be on the mailing list. Mm, absolutely. If you're more diverse. I believe that. Okay, Johannes, thank you very much for talking with me again. It was my pleasure, anytime. That's it for this episode. While you wait for the next one, you can subscribe to Git Rev News. Just go to links.gitminutes.com slash news and you'll be led to the site where you can subscribe to this monthly newsletter covering the latest of Git development and all the related stuff. Once again, you can find show notes for this episode on links.gitminutes.com slash 43. And there you can also support the show via Flatter or Gratipay. Big thanks to everyone supporting the show, including our sponsor DigitalOcean. Sign up using the promo code gitminutes10 for $10 of credit and you'll be supporting the show. You can post feedback or comments directly under these uh, show notes or send me an email on feedback at gitminutes.com. You can follow the show on Twitter or Google+, where you'll be notified of any new episodes, or head over to gitminutes.com and see all the ways you can subscribe there. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>